Welcome back, crew. It's October, and that means we are diving into Free League's amazing Alien RPG. For those who aren't familiar with it, this is based off of Ridley Scott's Alien franchise, uh, dealing with the xenomorphs, crazy corporations, uh, and trying to survive in the, the horror that is space. Uh, so if that sounds interesting, stay tuned, because today what we're going to be doing is going over the core mechanics of the Alien RPG system uh, and letting you know how to run this with you and your crew. So stay tuned for that, but a quick shout out first. We're holding our actual play of the Alien RPG system this Wednesday, October 26th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So come through, watch my players go through this. They're going to have some crazy, uh, crazy corporate antics and definitely some xenomorphs popping in and see if they can survive it. Uh, this is we all of our first times playing the system, so if you wanted to see this live in action and get to learn about some of the key mechanics as we play, I always like with the game of the month, kind of slowing it down and explaining the mechanics behind it, so make sure you tune in for that. But as always, with our game of the month, we raffle off a copy of the game's PDF. So if you wanted to, after kind of seeing our videos on how to build a PC, the core mechanics, and just if you're a good fan of the, the Alien franchise, come through and be, maybe you'll be one of the lucky viewers and get a chance to win a copy of the Alien RPG and bring it back to your table and have some great sci-horror adventures. So come through tomorrow or Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time on my channel, Tegan J Gaming at Twitch. Link in the description. But let's get into it. So today we're going over the core mechanics of the Alien system one with one big caveat. We are going to be handling stress and panic in our video that's coming out tomorrow. Apologize for getting scheduled. Real life got a hold of me. Uh, that video is going to be focused on stress, panic, and bringing horror to your alien game. So stay tuned for that one. But this one's going to cover all the core mechanics outside of that. Uh, so you kind of know how to run it when you get your chance to, uh, to bring this to the table. So the first thing we're going to touch on with this is kind of going over some of the core skills and pieces when it comes to this game. So, uh, as I mentioned in my first impressions of the system, this is a D6 game. Uh, so, with most rolls, you're just going to be rolling a D6. Occasionally, they have some D3 rolls that come through. Uh, and basically, it's going to be determined, uh, there's two ways you can roll. So, if you are, for lack of a better way to put it, proficient in a skill, uh, you're going to roll uh, basically your attribute plus your skill level. Uh, and that's how many D6 you get to roll. So if you've got a three uh, in close quarters combat and then a four in strength, you're going to roll seven D6. So with this system, you're like, hey, that's got a good chance to, to be successful. Probably too much chance to be successful. So Alien's a little bit punishing. Uh, but you get a lot of dice to make up for it. With this system, to get a success, to have a success on your action, you have to roll a six. Or uh, they've got a special like star marker if you're utilizing the actual Alien RPG official dice. But if you can use like any regular dice, just make sure you put a six. Uh, you note that a six is a success. Everything else is considered a failure. So that's going to be pretty lucky or you have to have a lot of skills within some points. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind with that side. Uh, if you're not proficient with the skill, you're still able to roll, but you would just roll your base attribute. So that's a nice thing. You still always usually have multiple dice you're rolling, uh, but when having to hit a six, and I know this from our times of Blades in the Dark, uh, even when you get to roll a couple dice, hitting a six can be hard. Uh, so this will be interesting to see how that goes on that side, just to see if the crew is able to get that in there and get enough successes to uh, to make uh, to get whatever they're doing. Uh, if they're trying to, um, to gun down one of the xenomorphs or run away down a corridor as a, one of the face huggers are chasing after them, they're going to be needing those sixes to be able to get through. Now, the nice thing, though, is you just need one six to be successful, but if you do get multiple sixes, you can uh, do stunts. So each of the different skills, like mobility, close quarters, range combat, whatever you're utilizing, have different stunts. So and the stunts are just different extras you can apply to the roll. And the more D6s you have, the more extras you can kind of pile on to that roll. Uh, so definitely kind of cool that side, just to be able to keep pushing, or to keep a kind of track of that, and maybe you'll get lucky and get to throw a whole bunch of extra effects on there. Now, one of the things you can do, though, if you just really want to stack sixes, is you can push your roll. Uh, so with this system, uh, basically, uh, after you roll, at the cost of one stress, and stay tuned for our stress video, 
uh, you can uh, re-roll all non-sixes. Uh, so cool on that side. So if you completely biffed it and got no sixes, you just re-roll all the dice. But if you got one six, but you needed, uh, let's say you were uh, using your uh, pulse rifle and gunning down a xenomorph and you need them dead this turn. And you got one six, but you need to get some extra damage on there. One of the stunts for ranged is getting some extra damage. You could push that, take one stress, re-roll all those dice, and hopefully you get a, a couple more sixes to, to put that Xenomorph down. I like that. I always like systems like that, whether it be Devil's Bargains and Blades in the Dark or uh, any system that allows you to expend a resource that has a cost behind it. And stress has some pretty dire cost. Uh, in order to uh, get another chance to success is great in my book. I love players having that autonomy or that uh this ability to be able to kind of play the way they like to uh and have a little bit of risk uh, to see hopefully they can get the best reward so i'm looking forward to that that's definitely one of my kind of my buds on this system and to see how that plays out and see how my players engage with that because i think that'll be pretty cool uh now last thing i'm just kind of rolling dice because uh, we mentioned that you roll your uh if you're proficient in the skill you roll the uh, level of skill that you have in there and the skills are going to be between one and five uh, as well as uh, your base attribute of that skill but one of the other th cool things you do with this is you add your stress level uh, to uh, dice that you roll so let's say you have three stress you roll three stress on top of your base attribute and your skill level so they say the kind of the more stressed you are, the more focused and kind of fine-tuned so it's kind of cool that the more your stress goes up the better your rolls are going to be but with the stress dice, you have to keep track of ones. Because if you roll a one on the stress dice, and they've got the face hugger as the uh, little uh, kind of animation for it, if you have uh, the actual official alien dice. Uh, but if you roll that one, you must roll a panic check at that moment. And as I said, next video we're going into panic checks and what those mean. But they're, you can tell from the efforts, it's not great. Uh, but I do like that too, though, especially with stress kind of tuning you up because it makes sense when you're stressed. You may make more mistakes, which is how you start panicking there. But you're usually thinking you're on the ball, you're paying attention. And I like how they actually have the mechanics support that. So that's really cool, uh, especially for this being like a sci horror game. Uh, have any elements, and there's definitely some cool elements to be able to add stress in for your players uh, and get them to panic uh, will be fun. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to tormenting my players with them. So cool on that side uh that's just kind of how you roll the skills we went over how to build your character skills but uh fairly simple with this one it's all d6s and just have to keep track of which dice are regular dice which dice are stress dice and keep it moving uh so now that we've kind of touched on that there's a couple other pieces that uh we got to cover for uh this system uh one of the other biggest pieces is kind of handling uh the adventuring environment for the game uh so with that Time and space are a big piece, and uh, with it being a sci-fi game, and I've realized a lot of the sci-fi, there's a lot of kind of more, you have to be a little bit more detailed in the rules, and they definitely hit that with this too. Uh, so they give you different measures of time, and these are definitely things you'll want to note if you're planning on running the game. Uh, one of the big pieces being is you've got the round, which for most players, if you're familiar with an RPG, this is simple. Between 5 and 10 seconds, I'm going to be lazy. I came from 5e. I'll probably just always keep mine 6 seconds. Makes it easy to fit into a minute, and everybody already knows it. Uh, you've got turn, which can be really confusing. If, uh, just so make sure for our game mothers in the system, because aliens, your game mothers, make sure you clarify if it's a turn, kind of what's going on. Uh, this is about five to ten minutes on the side. Uh, typically used during the stealth and the exploration runs, uh, but just kind of make sure that people know what's going on there. Some of the different things like recovery and healing go off of turns. Uh, so you just want to make sure that if you say, hey, it's your turn, there's a, tur a turn passed, that you're, you're being clear and it's not a round or whatever it was went through. And then you have a shift, uh, which is four shifts in a day. Uh, typically, these are between five and ten hours. Uh, so this is kind of like a, just breaking up the clock. So I, I, I would probably always do it in uh, six-hour shifts. I had to do some quick math there, sadly. Uh, but I would just do it in six-hour shifts, but you can kind of break it into anywhere, anywhere between five and ten hours. And with these, because it's variable, my recommendation, and this is, as I said, I'm new to the system, 
I would probably be pretty consistent in how you define these, just so your players know. Uh, it's like, as I said, I would be doing six hours for uh, the, uh, the the shifts, probably about five minutes for the turn, six seconds for the round. I think that just makes it easier for your players to know what's going on in the world, how much time is passing, so they're on the same page and nobody feels like they got kind of gypped on that side. So with this system... Uh, it's one of the things they really recommend, uh, and you can either do this through Theater of the Mind uh, or Maps. Uh, with some of the, I've looked through one of their cinematic play examples. Uh, they definitely do have a lot of maps associated with it. Uh, but usually, because Aliens, if you've watched the movie, I've actually just kind of got off my own little marathon for it. A lot of it is exploration, kind of moving through abandoned ships or abandoned facilities and kind of looking out for clues. Uh, so they built that into there. Uh, so during this kind of an exploration, a stealthy phase, you can um, move through different zones. And that's kind of how they break up movement in the system. Uh, versus saying you can move 30 feet. Uh, traditionally, if you're in um, adventuring phase, you can move two zones per turn as a human. Certain aliens can move faster than that. These xenomorphs included. Uh, but as a human, you can move two turns while you're not in combat. So... Kind of makes it easy on that side, so you got to know how far you can explore. Uh, you can also take different actions while you're in there, too. If you wanted to investigate something, that would uh, kind of take a little bit of that, too. And you can kind of go through and plot your movement on that side as well. Uh, and they also have a cool stealth mode thing, uh, which I think really... It really kind of hits the Alien franchise well. Uh, they give different rules for you, kind of running enemy movement uh, on the map and kind of comparing that to your players uh, and kind of see how they can detect others who may be uh, in the room with them. Uh, so your Alien can be there. They can either be active and active. Uh, they are hunting down the PCs. They know the PCs are there. If they're passive, they don't know the PCs are there and they're just kind of doing their own thing. Uh, the active ones are usually going to be trying to hide and pursue the PCs, uh, and they give you uh, kind of ways to, uh, and they recommend like uh, either having like a separate map for yourself as a GM or game mother uh, to be able to move those aliens around without your players knowing. Uh, for the passive ones, usually it's not going to be too big a deal, but for the active ones, especially if they are on the hunt, uh, it's kind of a cool way to be able to sneak up on players, ramp up that tension, uh, and uh, kind of make sure that uh, you got that horror element coming through. Uh, so cool on that side. Uh, they also give you some different ways on kind of how you manage your stealth roles when it comes to uh, how close and how far away the people are. Uh, so if you got somebody in the same zone as with you, you'd roll mobility. That's your stealth check on that side. Uh, but it'd be minus one. Uh, and typically they're going to be rolling awareness against you. Uh, so on that side, they kind of uh, hopefully the xenomorphs have some good stealth, or your players, if they're sneaking up on the xenomorphs, have some good mobility and can get some good hiding going through uh, and keep themselves hidden uh, from prying eyes. But that's a little bit about the, the the stealth and kind of how that goes with before you get into initiative. Uh, but let's get into how it goes once your players are seeing the face huggers, seeing the xenomorphs charge at them, how they're going to handle that. Uh, so this system is one of the ones that uses cards. Uh, so rather than having like uh, an initiative role like D and D, uh, with this system uh, you'll have uh, cards and they move through one through ten, uh, and your players will draw those cards and the DM will draw cards for his NPCs. Uh, now you're wondering like what if you have more NPCs uh, that you need more cards than ten? Uh, then the system recommends you kind of going through and grouping up certain NPCs who may like if you've got a couple face huggers, put those together. Then you have your xenomorph and another one. Uh, and then that way you can kind of keep everybody on, on that same 1 through 10 initiative. Uh, so, now that you've got initiative determined, you've got your cards out there. And the cool thing with Roll20 too, actually just, uh, I don't know if it's still free now, uh, but Roll20 was giving away the starter set for free. I put a tweet out. Hopefully, you're, if you're not following me, follow me on uh, Tegan J Gaming at Twitter too. But uh, Roll20 gave away the starter set for free. So I got to get some cards and stuff like that too so we can have those official cards. I think we got the official dice with that too. So you'll be able to see uh, me and my crew use some of the more official stuff uh, due to that. So shout outs to Roll20. Shout outs to Free League for that that because uh, that was really cool to see uh, i got a couple of my players actually downloaded it too uh, that are going to be playing in the system so i was happy that came through uh, but back into the rules so once you're in combat you can only move one zone uh well you can actually let me clarify so once you're in combat uh, when you take an action you can only move one zone 
Now within combat, you have two different types of actions you can take. You can do a slow action or you can do a fast action. Uh, now, fast actions runs. One of your fast actions, it lets you move one zone as long as no enemy is engaged with you. With this system, uh, if you don't want to do a slow action, you can do two fast actions. So like there's a Xenomorph chasing you down a hall, you can just dip out and run uh, and use both of your actions to do so. Uh, but now if you wanted to crawl or shoot or throw a weapon or do some close core combat fighting, uh, all of those will be slow actions will take some time. So makes it pretty easy on that side. You've got two actions to worry about. Uh, everything is like kind of based off of one of those a two actions. Uh, and the nice thing too is they give you some pretty nice stuff uh, in your fast actions like grappling and shoving and all of that can all be done as a fast action. So if you wanted to push somebody away from you and try to run, you can do that as a fast action if you can. Uh, so now that we've touched on movement, we touched on uh, the kind of the close combat or the the, uh, the different actions you can take. We're going to go over close combat real quick. Uh, so close combat on this side, you must be uh, engaged with the person. So you've got to be in the same zone right next to each other uh, on that side. Uh, and you have to kind of go through and be able to uh, throw a punch, throw a shove, jab, grapple, whatever you're doing on that side. Uh, and now some of these options that you have, like grappling and shoving or uh, retreating and things like that, uh, or grappling and shoveling, I should say, uh, are stunts. Uh, they're things you can activate uh, if you've got enough stunts uh, on your uh, first uh, kind of close quarters uh, roll on that side. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can block. So if somebody's coming at you, uh, you got a xenomorph coming in, you want to try to block their bull blow, uh, you can block. Rather, uh, you must declare that and use your fast action to block on your turn. So it's something that you must do and kind of let them know, hey, I'm blocking. Uh, and uh, then you can kind of, the, before the creature throws an attack at you on your turn, and then when the creature's turn comes up and if they do throw an attack at you, uh, you can block uh, and you can roll... Uh, your uh, close combat versus theirs to see if you can kind of reduce over a number of successes you get, you can reduce the damage by that much. So pretty cool on that side. Uh, now with that too, and one last thing I'll say with movement before we move on to range combat. Uh, so as I said, fast action allows you to move, uh, but uh, if you're in the same zone and you want to get into engaged distance with them, that will take a fast action move. Because just being in the same zone doesn't mean you're engaged because you can be kind of across the hall or whatever it may be. But once you spend that fast action, you can get in close and be engaged. Now, let's say somebody's in a fast action with you or uh, engaged with you and you want to be able to retreat. Uh, you must roll mobility. Uh, so you roll your mobility score. And if you get a success, you're able to walk away and get away from them using that fast action. Now, if you fail, you still get to get away, but the enemy gets to make a truly free attack against you. Uh, so definitely a little bit of danger on that side. And if you're getting away, and hopefully you can get a, make a free break uh, with that mobility score and definitely be a good one to push if you do fail. So now we talked about uh, uh, close combat. We're going to do a little bit on range combat too. Uh, so one of the things with range combat on this side is distance matters. Uh, so if you are medium distance on that side, uh, so kind of uh, within a zone or two, uh, you'll be... Uh, kind of minus one on that, uh, long range, minus two. Uh, if you're in engage, so if you've got a xenomorph right on you, it's a minus three to your, uh, and these are, whenever you see a modification roll on this, uh, just take it as minus the dice. So if you are engaged on that side, you would lose three range combat dice when making your roll. So it can be pretty difficult on that side. Uh, just something to keep in mind. Uh, but the cool thing with range is you get a couple of cool actions you can take uh, to help uh, modify uh, your attacks on that side. Uh, one of the biggest being uh, the aim feature. Uh, so you can aim with this system and it uses a free action and it gives you a plus two modifier so you get two additional dice to roll. Uh, so if you're long ranged, you can aim. Uh, and as long as you make the attack the same turn you aim with, you can um, just have a flat roll with that aim. I thought that's pretty cool. I always like different modifiers like that. That because uh, if you aim and shoot, you're stuck. You can't move. You can't do anything else because movement in this uh, is a free action or a fast action, I should say. Uh, so just something uh, to keep in mind there. But I always like giving players those type of choices, uh, how much they want to spend to make sure they get this perfect shot. 
The only other thing I'll touch on on this side uh, is the full auto feature, because I think that's pretty sweet. Uh, with this, uh, you get a plus two modifi modifier to your rolls. You get two extra dice. You gain a stress point. Uh, you also uh, panic. So uh, if you do go full auto, and you'll see them go through the panic rolls, uh, it automatically triggers panic. Uh, so definitely gives you something cool of that. So I just uh, uh, kind of, it's basically that moment, like it's the oh shit moment. Is any more bust through the door? Let's light up the whole room. Uh, the nice thing with this though is you can distribute any additional successes you get after the initial one to secondary targets. So really good if I uh, got a group of face huggers coming at you, you can just trigger that full auto, uh, and hopefully you get some good successes to be able to kind of get that damage spread around. Now. We've touched on that. We've touched on the range combat. The last thing we're going to touch on today is damage. Uh, so damage with this system, you know, as we went over with building a PC, you have a starting health equal to your strength score. Uh, so Virgil, he had a strength score of five, and he's going to be kind of our example guy for today. So whenever something does damage to you, somebody shoots you, or is even more slashes you, or gets their acid blood on you, uh, you're going to have to deal with your health and damage. Uh, so Typically, armor will help you protect yourself from uh, damage you may take. Uh, so the effects of the armor. So Virgil, uh, I forgot what type of armor he had, but he had a six armor rating. So if he took damage, he would roll his armor rating and dice, which I thought was kind of cool on that side. Maybe a little bit slow for some of the games, but I, I like that, how it fits in. I was wondering how armor rating would come to play. Uh, so you'd roll that six, and you'd get to minus any success you had from the damages that come through. Uh, so... Cool on that side, your armor is going to be protecting you. Virgil has got six six dice, so he should hopefully at least get one success on that. Uh, to be able, uh, by, fat, uh, by odds, he should be able to get one success to be able to at least minus a little bit of damage to him on that side. But let's say your PC is unlucky, uh, and that damage is just pouring through. Maybe he didn't have a lot of strength, and he is down to zero HP. So once you hit zero HP, you are considered broken. Uh, you, have, uh, you can only crawl. Uh, and you must roll a critical injury, and we'll show you that table in a second too, uh, and see kind of what crit injury you've got. And some of those critical injuries, like four of them, I should say, are death. Uh, we'll point those out when we get to that next session. Actually, let's go there now. So let's take a look at that critical injury uh, table, uh, just to kind of show you exactly what's going on on that side. So you see this is a D66 table, so you'd roll two, six, uh, two D6s, uh, and pierced head, impaled heart. Uh, those are the ones that automatically kill you, but you got the other end winded with nothing happens, stunned, nothing happens again. You got ones in the between two that can be kind of uh, just debilitating the further up you go on the dice. So you want to roll low for this one. Now. We talked on the critical injury. Last thing on this one we're going to touch on is the recovery. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways for you to recover on this side. Uh, if you're no longer broken, once per turn, and returns at 5 to 10 minutes, you can gain back 1 HP. If you were broken uh, and nobody's able to get you back up, once per you'll gain one your first HP back after a turn and get yourself back up. Now, if somebody's able to give you first aid, they can get you back up using a slow action on their turn and kind of get you back walking and no longer crawling and get you back into the fight. Now, death in this game. Uh, so, basically, uh, if you suffer a critical injury listed as fatal, uh, you're going to make, uh, after the time allotted for it, and we looked at some of those critical injuries, some of them have times next to them, uh, you're going to roll a stamina roll. Uh, and the stamina roll doesn't have, uh, there's no, uh, there's no stress included with it. There's no way to push it. It's just a straight stamina roll. And if you fail, you die. If you succeed, uh, you actually get to, uh, uh, you, you linger on, uh, but you make another death roll of that time passes again. Uh, so just something to keep in mind on that side, uh, you could definitely be uh, in a rough position. This game's, from what I've heard, is pretty lethal uh, and definitely one uh, where death is not uncommon. Uh, so keep that in mind as you're kind of adventuring your cross. But 
that's kind of a quick look at the alien mechanics. There's definitely a lot of mechanics we didn't have time to touch on on this side, but I wanted to make sure you knew how to run combat, how the range and close combat features worked, how many actions you could take, as well as how skills worked and how the resolution went through, and a little bit of how their adventuring system worked. So, I know it's a mechanic we probably forgot to mention. Shout out your favorite alien mechanic in the comments. Uh, definitely like, subscribe, uh, and make sure to join us tomorrow as we go through our stress and panic mechanics, but also just how to build, bring some horror into the alien game. So join us for that. This should be a fun one, but definitely make sure you come through this Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern time for our alien RPG actual play. And you can see this game live in action, see these mechanics rolled out with the crew. Uh, and maybe you'll be one of the lucky ones to be able to take home a copy of this amazing RPG. But join us Wednesday, like, subscribe, and until next time.